Good morning. Thanks for that introduction, and also thank you for this. I've never had such a prominent warm-up act uh, as of today. So uh, it's good to be here. And uh, well, yeah, when it comes to technology, it's booting right now. But what I find fascinating is that we see things like that the future is not what it used to be. We've always been a bit afraid of technology, a bit afraid of the things that are happening, all the new innovations, information overflow, and you see all these things today, right? But it was the same thing 100 or 150 years ago. This quote is actually from the 19th century. So we started thinking today that we're in a different time. Well, it's different technologies, different perspectives, different challenges, but still we have a lot to learn from how to look at history. But I, I just, hands up please, everyone, just need to get a sense of the audience. We know there's a few invest, fellow investors here, we've got some business people, government people and all that, but hands up everyone, just so I know. Do, do you still buy books, like in a physical bookstore? Okay, that creates a challenge for me here. No, um, drones, anyone? Flying drones? Yeah? Do you know what to use it for? I, I had no clue when I got mine. I mean, that's a challenge. You, I, I have this urge being a, an early adopter of things, and I always make up this good story when I come back home with a new package and really been struggling to understand what I should use my drone for. Do, bad battery life, bad camera, bad gyros, everything. But now, eventually, when we, after a couple of years, start to understand and learn and experiment with these technologies, we start seeing how we actually could use them. Uh, so, next one. Implants. Anyone? Yeah? Then we can exchange business cards afterwards, because that's roughly what you do with them, right? I have a big... Of course, I, I had to do this as well. Uh, for me, not that useful in my day-to-day -day setting. Every once in a while, I can get my hotel key on it. Have you done that? Yeah, no. But usually they just try to kick me out of the hotel and make me switch to another place. But, uh, but it's interesting to see how technology changes behavior. And that's what I'm really curious about. Behavior on a personal level, behavior on, on a more, in a business sense. And that's where I spend most of my time. Uh, as an entrepreneur and early stage deep tech investor, I love to be in the lab. I've been involved with nanotechnology companies, semiconductors, new materials, IT, different aspects of that for the past 20 years. And uh, love that part of it. I love the innovations, trying to create something, make a business out of some obscure technology. Uh, despise all the, the meetings, the lawyers, the bankers, no offense if there's anyone here, but it's all necessary. But that, that's not where I feel that I can add any kind of value. So I've switched lately, still work maybe half my time with these companies and new investments. And the other half, I try to get new, interesting perspectives, meet people like you, uh, listen in, meet with scientists, read things, just to fuel my curiosity about where we're heading from a business and technology perspective. Uh, I'm part of Washington DC-based think tank on emerging technologies. I'm working with the European Commission on a new innovation strategy for Europe. As was introduced, I wrote a book that came out last year on the business aspects of technology. Uh, I do the occasional keynote every once in a while. Try to, uh, and this is for Swedish politicians, I did a couple of weeks ago. No, uh, but mostly I try to digest all these things, try to understand where technology is taking us, try to see the effects and consequences of these, try to understand the challenges, see the opportunities in these different technologies. And just in a, as a disclaimer in this, since we're looking at technology, entrepreneurship, the opportunities here, but I just want to say that we are in a bubble when it comes to this. Capital is cheap, innovation is intense. This combination creates a bubble that is very challenging for anyone that wants to work in this field. The opportunities right now are more or less endless, but it's still a fact that you need to pick the winners from the losers. As an investor, I find it really hard right now 
to see what's, what's good and solid and what's just part of this bubble. Coming out of this, eventually when it bursts or at least inflates a bit, I think we're going to see some tremendous new opportunities, new technologies, a shift in how we work and live. But we need to be aware of the fact that it can't go on like this forever. So for me, when it comes to technologies, I'm fascinated by the fact that we see it doesn't really matter if it's a steam engine, if it's electricity, or if it's the computer. We approach new technologies in roughly the same way. We experiment, we find the interesting application, they get into society, and then we, we take them and, and they totally transform the way we live and work, like smartphones are doing right now, for example. And for me, gathering this information, digesting it together, I mean, by myself or together with this think tank, I put together a list of the 42 most interesting technologies and try to update that one as often as possible. Um, I'm happy to share this one with you afterwards. So I'm just going to give you a top five list of technologies that everyone is talking about right now. Scientists, researchers, entrepreneurs, uh, investors, and where the interesting focus is and where the interesting opportunities might be. We just start with number five, of course, genetics biotechnology, all these things that's happening in and around our bodies. We've seen some tremendous things happening in the past 15, 20 years. I mean, 15 years ago, we mapped the human genome at a cost of 300 million euros. It took 1,000 people seven years, and today you can do it in 24 hours. You can get a kit like this for a bit more than 100 euros, get your genetic scan, not a full scan, but very essential information about your health conditions and future risk of, of getting certain diseases. Very useful when you meet with a doctor in the future, but this also creates opportunities for entrepreneurs. I mean, a company doing these tests, of course, yes, but we see this coming in in maybe not so obvious uh, parts of business. We see it in, uh, in dating apps, where you can match your genome to the perfect future spouse. A bit weird, isn't it? Right. My first thought was that I'm not sure I want to marry someone that fits with my bad genes. I kind of want someone that improves my gene pool, but maybe that's just me. Uh, we see uh, in different parts of the world, in Korea, you can clone your dog. It's $150,000. And we have different perspectives on this, on how you actually relate to technology, you have an ethical, a legal perspective, things that are okay in Korea might not be okay in Europe, for example, meaning that in certain parts of the world, based on legal and ethical framework, you have an opportunity or an advantage before other parts of the world. So that's something that needs to be discussed. And also the ethical part of it, of course. I mean, today we can get a full genetic scan by, from an unborn kid just by a simple blood test from the mother. In one to two decades, we will most certainly have the technology to cut and paste and change the genetic traits of an unborn kid, meaning that we need to discuss how we should use these technologies. The opportunities, the possibilities are endless, and we as humans need to limit the scope of this. We need to decide how this should be used. We should not let that into hands of, of companies with profit demands, with, not with, from, with scientists that have their different perspectives on this. The political landscape, the, the whole democratic system is not suited to be the sole part in that discussion. We need to have this in society in among, and among ourselves. That's really important. Continue with number four. Blockchain, all the rage right now. Spoke to Barclays before here. And of course, blockchain for the banking system is interesting. Cryptocurrencies. Anyone owning bitcoins? Anyone owned bitcoins five years ago? Happy for you. Uh, all these things happening. It's, it's interesting. It's chaos. Long-term prospects are excellent when it comes to cryptocurrencies and the underlying technology of actually using these distributed systems of transactions and verifying people. So the financial sector, of course, got all these opportunities happening there. 
but you also see in other areas, in healthcare, for example, verifying patient IDs, patient journals. There's interesting ways of using blockchains there. I met with Maersk, this Danish shipping giant, and they are using blockchain technology to simplify the admin around a shipment. Today, it's roughly 200 documents if you ship a container from Africa to Europe. With their beta version of a blockchain-based uh, document system, you go from 200 to one document, meaning that you increase efficient efficiency tremendously based on that. So there are interesting aspects of this in many, many different fields of business, definitely. We continue, number three. Robots, of course. I mean, robots have been around for more than 100 years in popular culture. We've seen that. Today, we start seeing robots that can act on their own in different ways. Maneuver difficult terrain like this one, for example. Or robots that can walk like a human. Also very impressive from an engineering perspective. But how is it from a communications perspective? Is this the way we should communicate technology to make people curious about it? Put on a pair of boots, a uniform, and a gas mask. I don't know. I showed this one to my kids. My youngest, she's six-year-old. I did it while my wife was away. Uh -huh. And she, I mean, the six-year-old, she didn't sleep for a week. I mean, if you work with technology, if you're, if you're a large corporation, if you're a startup, if you're... Uh, in, in academia, you need to put some effort in to communicate what you're doing in a way so that you don't scare away your potential customers, right? Equally impressing, though. Uh, but you get the cute ones as well. This one, maybe the size of a deer, something like that. Also very impressive how stable it is on this icy parking lot, right? What's interesting here is that I mean, you can't do like that. When they launched this video on YouTube, there were Facebook groups started in defense of the robot. <laughs> yeah, meaning that we start thinking about this. We start relating to these robots as individuals. Some kind of empathy is growing among us. And it's going fast. Things that was not possible just a year or two ago is equally possible and really impressive today. I can't do that anymore. I'm not allowed to do it for my doctors. Um, but it's interesting how that works. But this is one specific thing. To put a robot in a more general con setting where doing things like humans do, they're not really there yet. We don't need to think that they should take over everything. Specific tasks, definitely. More general ones, taking out the dishes or moving boxes, well, so-so. But we're getting there, and it's going fast. So we're going to see a tremendous, interesting development here. And if you're, you're an aspiring entrepreneur or want to work with interesting stuff, of course, robotics <coughs> sorry, is definitely one area to look out for. Continue. Number two, autonomous vehicles. And that's interesting, because we've seen these things. We, we, we haven't seen them, really, out in the public, but we hear things about them. We discuss it. We try to understand how they could work, how they would change their life for taxi drivers or truck drivers or driving schools, for example. Uh, we see that we could decrease the number of casualties in the traffic when we have full autonomous driving. What I find interesting here is that once we get acquainted with a new technology, we start seeing the effects a bit further away from the obvious. One example. Imagine outside of Riga, Saturday night, you have four people going, going into the to clubbing, go to a bar or something. If that would be Sweden, you would have people in the car drinking beer or something else, and you would hopefully have one guy, girl, being sober driving, right? What happens when we get fully autonomous cars? You get four people drinking in that car. And bear with me for a moment. I mean, that means an increase in alcohol consumption in that group with 33%. And this is not a joke. We've had investment banks looking at the future of autonomous driving and finding that companies 
manufacturing alcohol, uh, alcoholic beverages are the, one of the industries that's going to benefit the most from this technology. Then we can discuss, discuss is that if that's good or bad. But it's happening, and what's interesting is that it was not this industry that the people who were developing these things said, so, okay, we're going to change how people drink and drive. That's not the main purpose of that. But we see things happening here. And then, of course, number one, AI. What else, right? Computers beat us in chess. They beat us in Jeopardy. They beat us in Go. And here we start seeing very interesting things that the computer actually is doing things that we could never achieve as humans, making moves that no human has ever understood or done before. We see robots, uh, AIs, software, that excel in poker. And they start bluffing. They start taking risks, things that we've never seen in the software before. So it's going fast here. This AI is definitely part of the bubble. It's a hype around that now. And next speaker, we're going to talk about the, the hype. But we definitely have a hype. The long-term prospects are excellent. Once you find the interesting things, it's really, really amazing what you can achieve with this. Like, we have different aspects of this. AI can be divided into three groups. The first is the assisted AI that improves what we do. Like in the medical field, we have AIs or machine learning systems that are actually better than humans in predicting and diagnosing cancer from x-rays. The next level of this is augmented AI. AI that can help us do new things. And uh, for example, in Hollywood today, you use AI and machine learning systems to actually help screenwriters write better scripts to make better movie experience for us. And the third level of this, where we're not really yet, is where we have machine intelligence without human intervention. Autonomous cars, for example. That's the obvious example. What we have here is different levels of AI on a timeline where there are different sets of opportunities for anyone interested at different sets of time. Some of them are more reachable today. Some of them will happen later into the future. So based on that, you can, of course, just stick your head in the sand, say you don't want to be part of this. But I really do think you should embrace these technologies, try to understand how they work. And for me, it's a three-way, three-part challenge. The first one is to try to understand and analyze technologies, try to see what's out there. How should I relate to that? And it's difficult. The most difficult part of it is the timing. I've been part of a couple of successful companies that's been doing really good. But I've been part of quite a few that's been turning out bad. And when it goes south, when it goes bad, timing is the greatest challenge in that. That's the main reason why we failed in those projects. And just as an example, you know what's, what they have in common? They start with the letter S, originally partly uh, based in Sweden as originators. The third and less fun thing about this is that I said no to both these investments. Um, and today, I mean, Spotify, this music streaming service, went public a couple of weeks ago, valuation of $26.5 billion. Skype, the second time Skype was sold was for, to Microsoft for $8.5 billion. And I, of course, I would love to be part of that. I shouldn't complain, but what makes me think about that is how these companies saw technologies before anyone else did. And they packaged it in a way that no one else did. Spotify, for example, they, they started looking at streaming services, cloud computing, big data analytics, mobile devices, smartphones, all these things they saw coming before anyone else and packaged that already in 2006, 2007. And what's even more interesting is when you look at the next step in this, when you look at the business perspective of it, how will a new technology affect my, my industry, my competition, my customers, my internal workings of my company? How will it change my business model for Spotify? that works with music streaming, they make you not, no longer buying music. You subscribe to a music service, which is a totally different way 
the industry works today. And that, I think, is quite fascinate, fascinating how technology drives business development and business innovation. The final part of this is when you look at, I mean, you have the technologies, you've identified them, you've seen how, they, how the timing perspective works, you identify interesting, challenging business perspectives out of this, and then the third part is, how should I relate to this? How should I adapt to this new reality? How should we organize work? How should we manage our employees with this new technology being part of our life? How should we face uncertainty based on this? And for me, uncertainty is a very wide spectrum of, of perspectives and ideas, but in essence, you can say that we have two extreme points when it comes to uncertainty and how you deal with uncertainty on a personal or a corporate level. If you're a big player, if you have lots of resources, lots of time, lots of money, you can be the one shaping an industry. Many large corporations can do that, or if you're, if you're dominant in a niche. For me, many of my companies that I involve, I'm, I'm involved with are small, four people in a basement somewhere, no money available. Then you have to adapt to what the big players are doing. So either you shape or you adapt. Often it's a combination of these two things. So that's, that's the third part of it. So just to repeat, I mean, for me, it <coughs> for me, this works as a mental model of how I view technologies. I analyze them. I try to look out for what's happening. I try to see the timing perspective of it. I assess the business implications, try to see how it will change the industry logic, for example. And then I adapt to that new reality, find new ways of working, new ways of dealing with uncertainty, for example. So that said, if you're not slightly confused now, you haven't really been paying attention, right? This should be confusing. It, it is okay if it's confusing. There's no right or wrong here. There's no, no right answers. We have to be a bit humble about this. We have to try to digest, understand, be curious, which is, I think, really important. Curiosity is of the essence here. But you also have to be a bit skeptic. Take in, analyze, try to understand, but also don't let anyone else tell you how you should relate to these things. But also, I think optimism is really important here. We really do need to think of technology, the future, in an optimistic way. We should definitely be aware of the challenges and the pitfalls and the dangers with technology. But I think technology is needed to solve a lot of the challenges that we're facing as humanity. So with that said, I'm done here. And uh, may the future be with you. I know it will, definitely. And uh, I would love to continue the conversation, not for Q&A now, but I'll be around here most of the day. And uh, if you want to do it, in any social network or anything. I'm more frequent in some than the others. Please connect and we'll continue the discussion online, right? So thank you very much. Have a great couple of days here and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Great, thank you very much, Nicholas.